Amen. This morning we come to the third in our series on transformation. We looked at our spiritual health. We looked at our physical health, one aspect of it. And today we want to look at another. We want to talk about our minds. We want to talk about our minds. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In our church, we often refer to this thing when we pray, and we say things like, uh, Jesus is a lawyer in the courtroom. He's a doctor in the sick room. And then there's a line we say he's a mind regulator. And I'd never heard that phrase before I came to First Baptist. I never heard the phrase mind regulator. But we just have a way of making stuff up. I mean, we can, we'll put a name to it. That's why every kid in the neighborhood got a nickname. We'll figure out a way to say what we want to say. But, but underneath this whole mind regulator is an acknowledgement that often there are things that go wrong in our heads. Can I get an amen? And I'm not necessarily talking about the far out. I'm just saying there's some times when our minds are not where it ought to be. Our minds are in turmoil. Our minds are in a situation that we need God to bring us back to a place of stasis. At the very least, we recognize that sometimes our mind is not our best friend. It tells us all kinds of things. Truth be told, there are some mind-related issues that are beyond the scope of us as laymen. We are unable to deal with it. This past week, Pastor Jared Wilson, associate minister at Calvary Chapel in California, committed suicide. But this is only the latest in a list of pastors, some of them very prominent, who have committed suicide in the last several months. And I remember when I was growing up, people would say stuff like, you know, if you commit suicide, you're going to hell. Now, first of all, you got to prove that from the Bible, and I think you can't. But the greater issue, though, is that our minds control what we do. And when our minds are not right, it can lead to some tragic ends. So I've dispensed with this thought that Christians can't be plagued with mental issues. That Christians can't be plagued with mind-altering situations. That Christians are immune from struggle with depression and anxiety. Because sometimes those things are not simply psychological. They can even be physiological. I never understood people who had phobias until I had a panic attack. And now I get it. And often we make judgments outside of a situation without fully being able to empathize with those that are in it. And you look at somebody and you say, how can you be afraid of a cockroach? Is all, I feel, all it is is a cockroach. Come on now, get it together. That's until your cockroach shows up. And all of a sudden, you want everybody to understand your reaction to your cockroach. But it's in the mind, the mind, the mind. There's nothing, there's nothing threatening about a cockroach. Those of us that don't have that anxiety or fear, we know it may be disgusting, but it's not fearful. Because, but something in the mind of the person that is fearful is telling them that this thing is to be avoided at all costs. Where does it start, though? It starts in the mind. To put it mildly, there are many that struggle with far less serious issues. And I'm not going to attempt to psychoanalyze and be a psychologist today. I want to talk about something else, and that is, how do we deal with thoughts that hinder our spiritual growth? 
How do we deal with thoughts and mind situations that complicate our relationships? Because that's where the majority of us live. Most of us don't live on the edge of suicide. Most of us don't live on the edge of depression, though some of us do. But we live in that gray zone where, we, where our minds sometimes don't allow us to function to the best of our abilities. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, a familiar two verses, one and two, and we want to look at two, but we want to begin with one. Paul was an excellent teacher. And here he uses a known practice. That is, he takes the known to teach the unknown. And Paul knows that the Jewish believers were familiar with the sacrificial system. And so he goes there to appeal to them, and, and in verse 1, he says, I beg of you, or I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, if you go back to the Jewish sacrifice, you realize that there were no living sacrifices. When the animal was put on that altar, the animal was literally killed. That was the sacrifice. And Paul comes in, and Paul takes that sacrificial ceremony, and he says to us as believers that he begs of us that we be a sacrifice, but we be different in that we be living sacrifices. We can get into all of this, a, a wonderful teaching moment, but, but, but we're to give our all while we yet live. Preacher once said that the only problem with a living sacrifice is that we keep crawling off the altar. There's a challenge. There's a struggle to stay connected, to stay in fellowship, to walk with God like we ought to. Listen, I have these weeks of highs and lows just like every one of you. There are moments when I'm riding high and God is good and everything is wonderful. And then there are moments when I'm like, oh, God, show, show yourself. And there are those moments when I walk or crawl off the altar out there doing my own thing. He says that we may crawl. In order to live like we ought to live, Paul says it starts in the mind. And so he goes in to verse 2. And he says we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. In order to be what God would have us to be, we need to begin to transform our mind. Everything begins in our mind. Every action begins in our mind. Everything we do begins with a thought. Can you raise your hand for me, please? Just raise it. No, no trick. Okay, you can put it back down. Before you raise your hand, your brain had to tell it to do it. It's quick. Every action begins in the mind. Now, some of us, our minds have been just filled with negativity and fear, anxiety, misinformation. Grew up in families maybe that were, you know, had our own way of doing things that was not consistent with the way things ought to be, and we have these weird views on life, but it begins in our minds. So why is it important to renew our minds? Number one, my thoughts control my life. In Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, in, in the Good News Bible, it says, Be careful how you think, for your life is shaped by your thoughts. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. How you perceive life is how you will proceed in life. You operate on what you believe to be true. And we come from families that shape our life and shape us into what we ought to be. If you grew up in a place where they said, listen, you will never amount to anything. No one from our family ever done anything. And if you hear it enough, you begin to imbibe that into your consciousness and you begin to live that way as you go out into the world. I'm unable to learn. I, I can't do math. I'm whatever. I'm, I'm, and we, our lives are dictated by what we think. My thoughts control my life. 
How many of you have ever wrestled with a thought that was spiraling you into some, whether it's depression, and you just couldn't seem to stop it? And so you begin to live that way. Some of us have been there. These pastors that I spoke about that end up taking their lives. No one takes their life unless their brain, unless their mind tells them that that's the best option. Because innate in all of us is what? Survival. We want to live. That's why we cling on to it. We, I mean, we can be at our end, and we're clinging on to life. Lord, you know, we, I don't want to go. No, nobody, nobody wants, everybody wants to go to heaven, and no one wants to die. That's because there's in us, there's this thing that wants to live. And so when people reach that place in their lives where they want to end it all, it's because they believe that that is the best option in that moment. But there's a second reason, and that is my mind is the battleground for sin. My mind is the battleground for sin. Listen to Romans 7, 22 and 23. My inner being delights in the law of God, but I see a different law at work in my body, a law that fights against the law which is in my mind, so of which my mind approves. It makes me a prisoner to the law of sin which is at work in my body. So we're operating on Satan's calendar, on Satan's agenda, and in our mind, that sin, sin is there and, and, and is propelling us to do that which is contrary to God. You ever wonder why it's so hard to live right? I just want to be right. Yeah, that's what we desire, but Paul talks about it in Romans 7. Paul said, man, time, the things, the good that I want to do, I find myself not doing, and the bad that I don't want to do, that's what I find myself doing. My mind is the battleground for sin. Wrestling daily to do what's right. And, and, and every sin is not some gross thing that would land us in jail. It's those thoughts. It's those impulses. It's those things that we do that we know are not right before God. And, 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 and sometimes we allow it to happen just because there is a vicarious feeling that comes from doing wrong. Come on, somebody, y y don't, don't sit there looking all pious now. If sin didn't feel good, we wouldn't do it. We get pleasure out of it. Now, if we're saved and born again, the Holy Spirit comes by and knocks on our door and says, then we feel guilty. But in the moment, in the moment, there is that vicarious feeling of pleasure. But I need to renew my mind also because my mind is the key to peace and happiness. Romans 8, 6, if people's thinking is controlled by the sinful self, there is death. But if their thinking is controlled by the spirit, there is life and peace. So there's that tension between the thoughts that bring us peace and life and the thoughts that bring us death and depression and heartache and regret. So what you tell yourself matters. What your mind says matters. So three things I want us to look at this morning. Number one, the truth matters. What we believe matters. Because we can believe wrong things, but if, if, if our goal is to be uh, children of God, we need to have the right food, the right mental food, the right food in our, in our brains. In Matthew 4.4, 4, he said, but he replied, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the only way we can get that in is we need to spend time in the Word. And if we're not spending time in the Word, we're not giving God an opportunity to work in our life. And we think that we could operate on Sunday mornings only, and that's it. If we're only depending on Sunday morning, we're sadly mistaken. I'm guilty, you're guilty. We spend far more time watching TV than we do feeding 
on the word. That's not a guilt trip. That's just a statement of fact. And so how do we expect to feed one part of our life and starve the other and expect the one that we starve to grow? If I'm feeding myself a lot of junk, a dear sister of ours pointed at my belly the other day. Pastor, what's going on there? I didn't answer in the moment. I'll answer now. Cake, <laughs> ice cream, pie, potato chips. All the junk that I ought not to be eating. But it tastes so good. Every once in a while, you need that salt fix as you lay on the sofa watching TV, that bag of chips that you know you shouldn't have sat next to you. And you, before you know it, you just ate a whole family size bag of chips. And then you want to know why folks are noticing stuff. But we don't spend the same amount of time allowing the Word of God to minister in our lives. Because if you starve that, it will die. If you starve it, it will be crippled. If you starve it, it will be weak. If you starve it, it will not have the power to overcome the other stuff, the devil's schemes. And so we ought to be busy about it. We ought to do it on a regular basis. We should feed on the truth of God all the time. Psalm 119, 47 says, I rise early before the sun is up. I cry out for help and put my hope in your words. Now, let me say this. I don't think that this is necessarily a prescription to do it early. It is a recommendation for early because some of us are not early risers. But at some point, you have to get with God. At some point, you have to meet with him. At some point, you have to feed your spirit. At some point, you have to go to God and say, God, I've come for my daily feeding. And so the truth matters. Feed on the word. If what my life will become starts in my mind, I must feed my mind healthy spiritual food. If you're going to be transformed, you have to know that the Bible is the centerpiece of your transformation. And when you take in the Word, the Word begins to impact your life and you begin to live like you ought to live. And so we have a choice in the matter, which brings us to point two, birds in your hair. Getting rid of destructive thoughts. It's been said that you can't stop a bird from flying over your head. But you can stop it from building a nest in your hair. What am I saying? There are times that the thoughts come, but it's up to us if we allow it to nest. Many people are consumed with destructive thoughts, and that's why we end up with situations we do. And so you've got to free your mind from your old nature, from your old nature. Romans 7, 8, 5, those who are dominated by their sinful nature think about sinful things. When you're doing that, you know that it's not from God. You know it's that old nature that's come on you, and that old nature that's dominating your mind and those sinful things that are coming in. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Do you wrestle with thoughts that you know don't come from God? Man, you want to see something horrific? Or you want to see a, a mass exodus? Take... Take, take, take a, a, a screenshot of our minds at its worst. And one Sunday morning, we just come and we just start rolling the screenshots. Be preaching to the pews. See, because see, until yours come up, you'll be all looking at it. Oh, look at her. Oh, that's what he said. Oh. And then, but then all of a sudden you realize, oh, mine's coming. <laughs> 
those who are dominated by their sinful nature. Think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, think about things that please the Spirit. Your old nature is not your friend. Here's something that, 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 that as a believer you need to understand, that that, that that old nature is not eradicated. If the old nature was eradicated, we would not find ourselves struggling with sin. We would not find ourselves uh, uh, being guilty of, of, of sin. But we know that it's there. But God has given us a new spirit, the spirit that lives in us, that now has the power to make us and to help us live right. So we must free our minds from our old sinful nature, but also from Satan. For he is a schemer. In 2 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, Now anyone you forgive, I also forgive. For indeed what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for you in the presence of Messiah. Why? So that we might not be outwitted by Satan. You know, when I find myself looking at something I've done or said, and I feel that true guilt, and I feel I say, oh, my goodness, Satan got me again. I fell into his scheme, fell into his plan again. We're outwitted. But then he says this, for we are not ignorant of his schemes, his plans. Basically, that word is, a, is the word is where you get the word schematic from. Satan's not out there really nearly playing this game. He's got a scheme. He's got a plan. And, and, and we're, the, we're the, sometimes the unwitting targets of his schemes. And often when we fight among each other, we're fighting because we're fighting on Satan's side. He's, he's got it all mapped out, and we're just pawns in his little game that he's playing. But we've got to be not unknowing that Satan is a roaring lion roaming about seeking whom he may devour. And so we've got Satan and finally the world's schemes or the world's values. 1 John 2.16, the Living Bible, he says, For everything in the world, the desires of the flesh... The desires of the eyes, the boasting of life is not from the Father, but from the world. We don't have a lot of time to develop it, but we live in a time when the world is just bombarding us with its values. We are being slowly boiled to death. I am guilty of it. You're guilty of it. The church is always behind, and we fight it. We fight the changes. We fight this, and we fight that, and we fight it. But before long, we just got worn right down. Before you know it, we're just embracing it all. The world, the desires of our flesh, the desires of our eyes, I want it. I see it, and I want it. The flesh, I want to consume it because it, it makes me feel good. Then we brag about life, the pride of life, the boasting of life. Look at what I have. Look at what I've achieved. Look at what I've done. And it becomes all about us. Here's what John says. He says, it is not from the Father, but from the world. When we have seminars telling us how to be the best, how to be on top, it's hard to fight it. Who doesn't want to feel that they're the best? Who doesn't want to feel that they're on top? Who doesn't want to feel that they're the head and not the tail? Who don't want to feel all that? And, and, and we are more than conquerors. We are uh, um, seated in the heavenlies. We are a little lower than the angels. But we have to understand that our relationship is our relationship to God is the one that seats us where we are. Not our own ingenuity. Not our own pride. Not our own manufacturing. It is who we are in Christ. So I give credit to God, and my mind tells me that, that, that I'm worthy. Why? Not because I'm so good, but because he is good. Because he is good. So, Pastor, you say, how do we fight this battle? Because I, I, I want to share this with you. Some of you today may say, I don't know what this message is about. But there's some of you sitting here saying, Pastor, 
Why have you been reading my mail? Why, 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 why have you been reading my mail? I, I, how do how you know I struggle with these issues? It's because the Bible already speaks to it. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10. We do not live in the world. We do live, sorry, in the world, but we do not fight in the same way the world fights. We fight with weapons that are different from those the world uses. Here it is. Our weapons have power from God that can destroy the enemy's strong places. King James says stronghold, but it's their strong places. Why? How? How? We destroy people's arguments and every proud thing that raises itself against the knowledge of God. And here it is. We capture every thought and make it give up and obey Christ. Now, this is talking about thought. This is our mind. This is where it is. We've got to get it under control. Number one, a strong place is a lie that I believe. What's that lie that you believe today about yourself, about your worth, about your family background? All of this, we, we, we tell ourselves these lies, we buy into these lies. That's a stronghold in your mind. And we have to face it at some point because we, we can just go by and say, well, that's just life. But maybe it's a lie from the devil. Maybe it's something that you've been told all your life that you've bought into that's not true about you. Paul says we've got to take those thoughts captive. When those thoughts rise up in, inside of you, you've got to take them captive. The Greek word for that is akamalotizo. It means to capture or to conquer or to bring under control. And I will tell you, there's not a week goes by, there's not moments that I have to stop and say, wait, God, 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 God. No, 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 no. That thought I need to get rid of. It's not productive. It's not helpful. It's not edifying. And I need to get rid of it. And I begin to pray. Because in those moments, I have a choice of whether to allow the bird to fly over my head or whether I'm going to allow it to build a nest in my hair. So because we ought to make it obedient, bring it into submission. Don't allow the thought, the negative, and the, 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 to, to, to take you off. You, you need to capture it and say, God, I come before you now. Because this thought, this thing, this lie, it's about to take me in a road, take me in a direction that I don't want to go, and I need to back off of it. So how do you make your mind mind? First of all, you've got to recognize that it does. But then you begin to pray. Prayer is the key. You start talking to God. When you're about to hit that depression, you need to talk to God. When you don't feel like getting out of bed, you got to talk to God. When you feel like you can't go on, you need to talk to God. You need to pray. Because prayer changes us in the midst of our situation. Your circumstance may not change, but you can change. Are, are, are you with me? There's some folks in here that will live with certain circumstances until the day Jesus calls you home. The situation may never change, but guess what? You can change in the midst of your situation. I don't want to preach you some pie in the sky that all your issues are going to be solved on this side. You may go to glory with that issue being just what it is, but guess what? You can live above it. You can rise above it. You can live in victory in spite of the situation you find yourself in. In. But it begins in our mind. Finally, we need to focus on lovely things. It's what you focus on. I love Philippians 4, 8. It, it, it is an incredible scripture. It says this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. Now, that's true, whatever is true and truth, but whatever is true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any virtue, if there is anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The, another name for your house is your dwelling. Your dwelling is where you what? 
Live. Your dwelling is where all of your possessions are. Your dwelling is where you eat. Your dwelling is where you rest. Your dwelling is where you cleanse yourself. Your dwelling is where you make memories. Your dwelling is that place that occupies the center part of your life. And he says here, if there is anything worthy and honorable and admirable and pure, dwell in that place. And so in your mind, you've got to find the good things, and then you, you, you set up camp. You, you make your life comfortable where? In the good thoughts. Don't become carried away with the negative and the false. He says, if there is purity, if there is virtue, if there is commendable things, I want you to, I want you just to, 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 to settle down. Live there. But you have to not be overcome with the negative. Some of us live with negative thoughts. And you know what negative thoughts does? It seeps out. Ornery people are ornery for a reason. They treat other people poorly because they themselves have other issues. And let me help you. When somebody's mean to you, you have two choices. You can allow that to suck you into their world of dysfunctionality and crazy, or you can take a step back and say, I don't know what's wrong with you, but I'm okay. So when you get okay, let me know, because I ain't about to get on that train. That's your train. Now, you, you can ride that train. Before you came over here, I was good. And now you just came over here talking about get on my train. I don't want to be on your train because where I'm at is a good place. I'm dwelling in goodness. I'm dwelling in truth. I'm dwelling in righteousness. I'm dwelling in holiness. I'm dwelling in all the pure things. I'm dwelling over here. I don't want to live over there. If you want to live there, now you can live. I'll throw you a lifeline. I'll tell you you need to pray. I'll tell you you need to come to Jesus. I'll tell you you need to get it right. But I'm not going to make up residence on your side. I'm going to live over here. I'm going to dwell in Christ's mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. I want the mind of Christ. I don't want the mind of the devil. I don't want the mind of Satan. I don't want the mind of the world. I don't want the mind of the enemy. I want the mind of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to live in a place where, where life is beautiful, where life is wonderful, where life is glorious, where there's joy and happiness and peace. I don't want to live in a life on your side of the tracks. You're living in a crazy place. But some of you all think, oh, no, he ain't going to talk to me like that. No, 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 no. Just say, excuse me. You can have that. You can have it. I'm good. I'm good. Don't allow Satan's schemes to suck you into that. But you've got to think because our emotions kick in first, you know. Somebody does us wrong, and right away we want to defend our honor. And we've got to stop and say, wait, 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 wait. He who makes you angry controls you. If somebody makes you angry, they just took control. And so you think you're fighting back. Oh, I'm a fool. You ain't going to talk to me like that. They just, they got you. Fight over. Ding, ding, ding. They won. You lost. But if you keep yourself, as Paul says, in all situations, then you can come out on the other side not being. Thing. So three things that will be done. Number one, in order to do this, you need to think about Jesus. Think about Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. What? Despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne. God, think about Jesus. Look at what he went through. And the Bible says he did not even retaliate. Think about Jesus. Think about others. Place them above yourself. That's what Philippians 2, 4. Do not just think about your own affairs, but be interested in others too and what they are doing. And number three, think about eternity. Think about eternity. Oh, when you're in this, my, my mind, I, I can take a whole different perspective when I realize that this world is not my home. I'm only passing through. 
My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's glorious shore, and I can't be at home in this world anymore. I'm on my way to heaven. For Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. And so when I'm in the midst of this struggle, when I'm midst, I remember heaven. That at the end of the day, all of this is going to culminate in a beautiful and wonderful relationship with God in his presence forever. The child of God can focus our minds on eternity. Because eternity also leads us to see other people the way God sees them. Their souls desperately in need of salvation. And when we see that God has called us to be his instruments of reconciliation, our job is not to get caught up, but our job is to maintain our thinking clearly, renewing of our mind, renewing of our mind. I don't think the way I used to think. I think the way God wants me to think. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's where I stand today. I'm a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. I'm an overcomer. I'm not defeated. I'm an overcomer. Sin shall no longer reign in your mortal body. Why? Because I know that I have the power of the Spirit of God to live as God would have me to live.